system do some of that identification. We can then use that structured data to some of our clinical analytics solutions to really try to get to connections of cost to outcomes. They have to be where we move in the future. And we need better structured data in order to get there. And more importantly, we need consistent content. We can't, if we're going to get down to connecting cost to outcomes, have variability um, within the data that we're trying to do that connection with. Um, it, 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 it will cause any uh, um, analytics and any dis um, conclusion that we can come to um, under scrutiny because we're, we're not necessarily looking at the same information across the board. And then finally, use this better data to enforce a supply chain formula. Um, Supply chain over the past few years has been very good at putting their arms around the items that our end users see and really trying to control costs by controlling what folks see. The problem with that, and, and we'll go through some statistics here in a little while, is that's not really what's happening in the industry. It's not really being overly effective. We're seeing um, in many of our customers and organizations we work with almost up to 35 percent of the spend and up to 45 to 50 percent of the items happening outside of the item master. And really difficult to control and standardize and get the ability to, to um, enforce those decisions at that end user level if it's coming through as non-catalog or non-structured data. We need to make sure that that information is coming in so that everybody knows what that information is and what our supply chain formulary is more important. So why is this a problem? Why is content such an issue within healthcare today? Well, first, if we take a look at the overall market, we're looking at about 20 to 30 million items available to hospitals today across North America. Part of the issues with that content is a couple things, especially as you start taking a look at it from the provider sector. The amount of change happening in that data is pretty astronomical. We got 20 to 30 percent annual churn of the data that's coming through. And that's due to new product introductions, vendor consolidation, manufacturer consolidation, uh, new product uh, introductions, as I said. But we're getting a lot of change. So trying to keep up with a 20 to 30 percent churn rate of our item masters becomes very difficult. And then the data has to be looked at in a couple of different ways. When I look at the content from a provider perspective, I'm going to contract in many cases with a GPO. And that GPO is going to, to go out and contract with the manufacturer. The issue is, is most organizations today do some level of vendor um, distribution of those products. So the, the onus on doing that cross-reference between the manufacturer and the vendor and to validate pricing based off of contracts is really on the provider. There's obviously tools out there that can help us do that with the cross-referencing, but the, the bottom line is, provider is responsible for that cross-reference. And we're not all that great sometimes ourselves as we start taking a look at content and we start taking a look at data. If you look at most um, MMIS systems out there today, we're going to see vendor and manufacturer duplication based off of the fact that we've called that manufacturer's or that vendor something other than its standard name. I can tell you the number of systems I've gone into where I've seen O&M as well as Owens and Minor um, as well as other things that are out there to identify vendors. Very difficult sometimes to match up information when we're not necessarily always the best on our own. Then when we start going out to the end users of our, of our organizations, what they call items and what we call items are two entirely different things in some aspects. Um, take a look at the oldies but goodies, your standards that everybody brings up when they talk about this, chucks instead of an underpad. Christmas trees instead of a tubing connector. I know when I was in the facility, the first time someone asked for a Christmas tree, I started running the target to look for the, the green triangle with the red balls on it and was completely wrong. But this happens across the board, and they're not always 100% universal. I was at a facility not too long ago that was looking for white sticky things. I asked, what's a white sticky thing? They said it's a lancet because it's white and you stick people with it. Unless you're in peace, then it's the blue sticky thing or the pink sticky thing. This happens all over the board, people calling things what they want. We need a, a method to control that information as well. And then you start taking a look at just really trying to get all the information we need to look at some of the products that we have, especially PPI items. There's not enough space in our systems to really do that. 
So what are some of the problems that are caused by this content? Well, 70 to 80 percent of all transaction errors that are happening in the supply chain today are directly related to inaccurate product information. 24 percent of supply chain management's time is being spent correcting these nonconformance errors. What we've even found is a couple of other things. About 3 percent of a hospital's spend is leaked throughout their organization. And that's obviously on an average piece. And what we mean by leakage is paying different prices for the exact same product across my organization. That can happen by buying a catalog item or a contracted item off outside of the item master. It can happen because I have disparate MMIS systems across my IDN and I'm trying to pull everything together. So it can cause some significant amount of spend that's going outside of our organizations. We still have a significant amount of nurses' time being sent, spent searching for supplies, both at the um, inventory or the, po the point of use level, as well as when they need to do special orders and everything else. What we've also found is there's significant overpayment on physician preference items. And a lot of times this happens because things are being bought outside of the item master. And sometimes those items are being bought and they're not, they're putting list price on the PO and that's what they're paying, even though they may have a contract available for that particular item. Where this content can kind of be put in context is when we start looking at numbers and just looking at the pure scale that, that IDNs are looking at. This is an average sized IDN, um, medium based uh, Midwest IDN taking a look at six months of purchase order history. We're looking at about 162,000 items, distinct items were being purchased over that time frame both med surge as well as other items. About 78% of those were med surge. About 60% of those med surge items were being bought one time and about 37% of the spend. So if you start taking a look at that, there's about 23,000 uh, 23, of those items were ordered outside of the item or in the item master and of which of those 23, about 14,000 of the items were physically med surge. You look at that by dollars, about $202 million was included in that, that purchase order history information. Um, $126,000 of that, or $1 million of that was purchased only one time, and about 32% of that was medical surgical. So we just look at those numbers, and how are we going to keep our systems clean and in sync with that amount of data going through our systems? So if we start taking a look at those and extend that, we really looked at that particular organization's catalogs and contracts they had available to them. It's about 600,000 items available in their GPO portfolio, as well as some of their local agreements that they had in their organization as well. About 14,000 of those were actually physically loaded into their ERP system, and only 6,000 of those had recorded purchase activity. So they had a lot of spend happening against these items that they did not have controlled systematically. It was a manual process. What that came out of is about 14, almost $1.5 million in price variance over that six month time frame. So a significant amount of spend leakage happening. Now not all the time would that price, that price variance be incorrect, but there is still a significant amount of spend that was changing every time they physically bought that particular item. So if we start taking a look at that even in a, in a more detailed scenario, and this is to me pretty um, systematic or pretty illustrative of where we have potential issues in our supply chain and more specifically around content. If I start taking a look at this information, here's a single item at the manufacturer and at the GPO level, surgical hand scrubs. Pretty, pretty easy item, pretty commodity based item. However, when we push that item out to the end user or to the hospitals, if I start taking a look at that item, I have, in this particular example, ten or nine different vendors, ten different descriptions, ten different catalog numbers for the exact same particular item. The difficulty with this is, is in many cases, every single one of those descriptions and every single one of those catalog numbers is a valid way for an end user to try to find that particular item. Not saying that everybody is going to do it that way, but when I look at that and if I was out looking for, for something, everything on this screen is a valid description that potentially an end user could take a look at. 
we need to start taking a look at how do we determine the suitability in the context of use of that. What artificial intelligence gives us the capability to do is really break down that description into its component attributes. I know what it is. I know what the valid name of that particular item, but more importantly, I know it's surgical scrub. I know what its composition is. I know what its um, manufacturer catalog information is. I know what its vendor catalog information is. I know what its brand name is. All of those are different attributes that can be assigned to a specific item, a specific description, and a, more importantly, it is a, a specific way to look for that particular item. So if we start taking a look at what our item masters have done today, the noun type, color, and size descriptions that we've thrown out there across the board. When I look at a manu uh, an MMIS system and, and being at McKesson, um, been there on and off for, for 20 years. I've had a couple sabbaticals. I worked in other technology companies. I also worked on the distribution side. When you really look at a materials management information system, in many cases, the descriptions in the item master is really there fundamentally to designed to manage inventory. In many cases, it's lacking of descriptive detail. There's a lot of systems out there that provide descriptions in the 35, 45, 50 character description. How do we put enough information in there so our end users know what they're looking for? We really use to pr process orders, not to compare items. So we've done other things to compare data in the, in the past. We've done things like commodity codes or product classification. And we've moved over into UNSPSC codes. And while they've been beneficial and they've provided some granularity, we still probably aren't granular enough in many cases to do some product comparisons very difficult in some cases to validate price. The information you're seeing on the right here is actual descriptions within MMIS systems that we've seen. This is actually a single MMIS head, all of these descriptions. How do I know the differentiation between all those different screws? Those are separate items. It's very difficult to take a look at that. So we're really relying in many cases on that manufacturer number match to make sure that we get the GPO contract. It's really the way a lot of, 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 of add-on systems run is, is you're going to throw that information through an engine, that engine's going to return anything that matches. We need to be a little bit more granular, a little bit more distinct in that information. So what we need to start taking a look at, and what really, what artificial intelligence gives us the capability to start taking a look at and doing is taking a look at data and assigning context and really looking at it from multiple sources. We need to take a look at data and extract it and normalize it from all industry sources. We need to be looking at manufacturer catalog data. We need to be looking at GPO contract information. We need to be looking at hospital data. And all of that needs to be normalized in the exact same way. We need to make sure that we've got the same characteristics in that data and then intelligently attribute that information so that it can be conditioned to meet the needs of the end user that's looking to disseminate that information. And what we mean by that is if I go into a system as a supply chain person and I'm looking for a 14 millimeter by 2 millimeter diameter um, stainless steel cortex interlocking screw, I might put that as screw, cortex, and the rest of my information on that so that I can drive to a specific in set of information. But as an end user, I might be looking for a, a cortex screw and put the, uh, the information of sizing and everything else after the fact. Or I might have a name for that because it looks like a golf tee. It may be a golf tee that I go into the system looking for. it. All of those are valid ways for people to take a look for that information. How do we support that? You know, I often talk to customers and, and when we, we kind of walk through the problem to illustrate it, I said, you know, it would be like walking into the grocery store and asking for a bread loaf rye one pound. And if, I, and if I did that same thing and walked into the grocery store and said, hey, where's your one pound loaf of rye bread, having the person look at me and say, hey, I have no clue what you're talking about because it doesn't match the context or the string that I've put in. We need to make things and the attributes. It's where attribution becomes so important is, it, once data is fully attributed and enriched, but artificial intelligence then gives you the ability to take a look at it in any way or form that I want to. 
think of that from an internet search perspective. If I type into the system box score Chicago Cubs win, and by the way, probably get no results, um, but or I type in Chicago Cubs box score, I want to get the same information, and most internet engines are going to give you the exact same links regardless of the word order I put it in. We need to use the same type of technology in our systems today to support that functionality. So when you do this type of information, it gives you the capability to start taking a look at specific steps or, or be predictive and, and, and consistent in the way that we're doing specific pieces of information. I start taking a look at data. It gives you the ability to normalize that data. What we mean by normalization is really standardize on one variable or a set of variables that provide value or support for comparison. It could be manufacturer and vendor catalog number together as my normalization. It could be just manufacturer catalog number. It could be just vendor catalog number. But we need to normalize any specific valuable that variable to identify that particular item. And then fully attribute the data. And this needs to be done consistently. We need to have variable, nouns, types. And what's the fixed or the dimensionable? Um, you know, when I look at, at, at at variability from product family perspective, it's pretty easy to normalize and say, I'm going to go based off of noun and type. So bone screw, surgical glove, all of these are going to be able to then group this information together. Some of those are going to have similar variables amongst the product family. For surgical gloves, what's my size? What's my latex content, powder content, cuff type, fingertip texture, um, thickness, latex content, sterility, all of those are fixed dimensions or variables or attributes that can be applied to that product family. So then gives you the ability to really start taking a look at things um, a little bit differently and a little bit more greater detail based off of those, those variable nouns and types by applying the fixed dimensional attributes against that. Then you also need to take a look at the, the alias terms that those items are, are, are out there and associate that information back to the item data. So if I have an end user that types in Christmas tree, they get the tubing adapters. If I type in chucks, I get the underpads, or vice versa. It's just, in that particular case, the alias term, in many cases, is just another attri fixed attribute against that particular type of product. It makes the ability of that identification much, much easier. You normalize these alias terms to that individual um, version of that information and then retain those uh, alias mappings back to the original value. Artificial intelligence can even be applied to do this automatically. So if an end user goes into the system and searches for a Christmas tree and ends up on a cube tubing adapter and three different um, users do that exact same search with the same result, isn't that by default a valid alias for that particular type of product? We have this technology and other, other um, industries and other systems all over the internet today. Why can't we do the same capabilities around healthcare content? We start taking a look at that from you know, what we're used to consuming as consumers around the internet day to day. I don't worry about what I call something. Heck, I can make a typo half the time and the system knows what I'm trying to take a look at and, and returns that information accordingly. It just makes everything and it makes the searching and makes the identification much more powerful. So once that's done, you can start taking a look at contextual word association. And what we mean by that is really take a look at the attributes for that word scrub. And we take a look at the word scrub. And it's amazing when you start looking at that, how many different nouns, types, and potential trademarks that, a, that individual word can mean. So if I look at scrub from a noun perspective, it can be a pant, a shirt, a brush, a pad, a dispenser, a, um, a, a, a specific product. Um, it can be a cleanser. It can be a sponge. So you think about something as innocuous as scrub. When you start taking a look at that from a contextual perspective, it can become a very daunting aspect to how we're going to go ahead and make sure that that is a specific value that you want to look at. 
The interesting part about that is when I take a look at that word, scrub is never really going to be a noun. At best, it will be a type. And more oftenly, it's going to be an attribute or a descriptive element of the item itself. So when I'm looking at scrub, I may be looking at that as a, as a, a cleanser hand. Scrub is then a third word within that particular area. The same thing can happen with antiseptics, um, the different types of scrubs that are out there. Is it a prep? All of those are just additional attributes. It can be used as a type. You know, I can say the noun of pants and a type of scrub. It's scrub pants, it's scrub jacket. It's got a different context. So when we start taking a look at the information, we have to make sure that we put into context what that word means based off of how it's used. This is really where we start taking a look at what we call intelligent attributes. The same word can't be used in the same way for every single type of noun, product, trademark, or type. So what we need to be able to do with that particular set of information is really start taking a look at aligning those intelligent attributes based off of a specific user need. And what we have the ability to do then is take a look at attribute and alignment based on a couple of different ways. From a pure healthcare supply chain item perspective, we can look at those really from two major aspects. Do you look at that from a functionally similar perspective or a functionally equivalent perspective? Functionally similar is like items, scrub pants, bone screws, surgical gloves. And maybe I take that one step further and I want to take a look at all of my latex-free surgical gloves. When I start taking a look at it from a functionally equivalent perspective, it really takes it deeper. It's glove, surgical, latex content, sterility, size, composition. Do I want, is our nitrile gloves the same as other latex-free alternatives? Maybe, maybe not. Does thickness matter? All of these things are relevant towards that content in order for the artificial intelligence engine to really start taking a look at the data to return valid information. All of that goes together to really identify now functional relevance of attributes by noun, by type, by product. What that does with artificial intelligence is it really gives you the ability to start aligning information based off of that data. Because you're using artificial intelligence, and, and there's systems out there for years that have done this kind of contextual attribution manually. Think of all of the data cleansing um, solutions that are out there today. The issue that happens sometimes is the minute you do this manually, there is human intervention or human context to what that means. And two different people can take a look at the exact same product and potentially attribute it a little bit differently. If we're going to be using a system or using the ability of, of, of systems to really get predictive analytics, the consistency has to be there. What artificial intelligence does, not only can it do it quicker, it can also do it with much more consistency because it, it to be quite honest, it's dumb. I'm looking at something, I see that word, that word in context with this particular product family means X, not Y, and it's automatically done that way. Even if that's wrong, it's at least consistent so that you have the capability then to set up rules and capabilities so that I can look at and align data to do that. So when I look at that, it really starts taking a look at our, our data in many cases as a product family. What's the value of a product family when you really start taking a look at enabling that data to support the predictive analytics technologies that we need to get to? Everything lines up. Since I have consistency and attribute and it's a quantitative value, all of a sudden I have the ability to see how many different products do I have that match a specific set of attributes. So I can take a look at latex-free polyisoprene surgical gloves that are sterile, latex-free in size 7.5, how many of my are using? And that identification becomes very important from a standardization perspective 
but in many cases, providers are willing to have standardization issues. I got multiple of these types of products that I'm bringing in for a variety of different reasons. It could be physician preference, it could be thickness, it could be other things that I'm bringing all these different types in. What's the cost of that? How, do, how does that alignment then matter when we start taking a look at usage, both quantity and associated price? Do I have an opportunity? What is the value of the standardization process for that particular type of product? It makes it very analytical because everything is aligned. And it also makes it very easy to change. Let's say that historically we've looked at, at, at surgical gloves and thickness was a very um, needed attribute. You know, obviously from an OSHA perspective, depending on the length of case, I may need to have a thicker glove for a longer case. Maybe those structures change. Maybe the recommendation changes. And now the thickness isn't as big of an issue because the technology or the material being used to create the gloves doesn't break down. And I'm not having tearing or, or the associated problems with a thinner glove that a surgeon may want to use for feel. Well, all of that information can very quickly be changed because all that is is now another attribute that I'm looking to compare that product family. So it immediately gives me the ability from an analytical perspective to switch everything around and now take a look at context a little bit differently. So what does this enable? What is this ability? It gives you the ability to detect new non-authorized products entering the system. I know what's attacking what I've already got in inventory or I'm already using it because the attributes line up. It's not a mystery at that particular point in time when somebody brings something in that might be a, a new product that needs to take a look at. Now it's very easy to say, hey, this has been used. Identify it. Identify that spend up front. Pass that to supply chain so that, that particular request can be gone through our product value analysis process rather than bought, brought in the product and pushed out. Also gives you the ability to benchmark best practice for product utilization by product family. Because you're going to go through, everybody would go through, and, and one of the things that, that we've learned in, in discussing this, this idea with, with organizations is once you've been in a hospital or when you've been to a provider, you've been to a provider. Everybody is going to look at some products differently based off of the way their clinicians define equivalence. That's why it has to be very flexible in order to go through that process. But it also gives you the ability to say, hey, if we do these specific attributes, what does that do for product utilization and standardization and opportunity? It also gives you the ability to compare and consolidate product use across the network. And as we all know in our IDNs, all of our networks are growing. So we're consolidating systems left and right. And, that, and sometimes from a supply chain perspective, it's not always the first system that's going to be consolidated. In many cases, it's, it's down the road away after the clinical systems. So what do we do in the meantime to provide value by that product utilization? Uh, with product attributes and, and form, formulary-based artificial intelligence, it gives you the ability to bring that data in, attribute it, see where you line up. See where potentially I might have something in my warehouse as the, as the buying entity that I can supply to that organization that is a functional equivalent product and immediately do that product switch based off of contract portfolio. Gives you the ability to do that quickly to, to speed some of the, the benefits of these, these groups that are coming together. It also gives you the ability to prioritize standardization initiatives based off of predicted value. We've had organizations use these techniques and identify really low-hanging fruit that potentially didn't see it. Trash bin liners, commodity product. What happens when you look at them across an IDN? It's no longer a commodity when you're looking at that volume. What does that variability cost? We need to have the capabilities to do that. So if we start taking a look at this really from a value analysis perspective, it becomes somewhat of a math problem that we need to solve. We start taking a look at data and challenges. If you take a look at a normal organization, um, if you're taking a look at 28% of the spend and 55% of the items happening outside of your item master, which is what we see um, in our customers that we've talked to about the average, how do we get access to all that information? And if you start taking a look at an average a hospital having 14,000 items, and then you get to a large IDN that's looking at more like a 70,000 item, item master. 
what does that do to the actual data? I mean, if you're looking at that internal loan at, a, at an average single facility, 14,000 items, if you're at the low end at 20%, that's 2,800 items that are churning year over year that we've got to make sure that we're keeping an update on. If you take a look at that, that's 40, that's 40 to 50 a week that I've got to get through. Let alone you start putting that through a, a larger IDN, you're talking about 14,000 items turning over a year. It becomes a daunting aspect of how do I keep up with the information that's going through. And then you take a look at that from a value analysis perspective, and if you look at a typical value analysis process that's getting them through about 1,000 items a year, even if we go to the 80-20 rule of 80% commodity, 20% position preference, which I'm not convinced that that's the right numbers, I think it's more of about a 40-60, 40% PPI to 60% of the items being commoditized. Imagine how long, if I, even if it's 20% of 17,000, if I'm getting through 1,000 items a year, it's going to take me 14 years to get through the data that's turning. How are we ever going to catch up? We need to be able to prioritize that information, and we need to be able to use structured data to do that. What we also need to do is align that better data to spend and really start taking a look at where does the data identify potential opportunity. And opportunity can be looked at in a couple of different ways. You can look at opportunity by what variability in spend has happened. You can also look at variability by where we've gone outside of our standard agreements and cannibalized on a specific item. But knowing what that variability in spend is and identifying it and quantifying it gives you the ability to take a look at products deeper, and it also gives you the ability to prioritize. If I'm losing $10,000 a month based off of one type of product because of variability, and I'm only looking at about $100 for another item, which item am I going to hit first if they're different product families? It makes the, uh, the ability to prioritize prioritize a lot easier. What the standard process does is you can look at that also by vendor and, and work with your vendors to identify where you may have variability and go back to them. Maybe you're not contracted on a specific type of product with your, with your supplier today. This gives you the ability to see that you've got an issue and how do we identify or expand our portfolio to make up for that particular process and have that ability. What it also does is it gets rid of the descriptive mask that happens sometimes when we look at our descriptions within our systems. Even the best organizations that are out there that have the cleanest systems that, that, that we've seen have variability. But that variability costs when you're looking at, at particular data is it masks sometimes the families that potentially an item can, stick, can, can fit into. So when we look at an original description, the description can be a variety of different things, but once fully normalized, fully attributed, and aligned, I can see where everything lines up. And potentially, I'm only looking at now as a product family is a difference in, in length. And shouldn't that be linear, rather than potentially one item costing more than another, even though potentially it might be smaller or larger? It just we want to be able to take a look at variance based off of that family. And product family management really gives you the ability to see all of that information. So what we really need to, to use all of this structured data, we suggest that you really take, take a look at a true content-centric content process that feeds, continually feeds your value analysis project process with better information and then enhances that or complies with that through the process. So every piece feeds something else. So my contracts are feeding my requisitions and my purchasing. My distribution is feeding my, my point of use system so that I'm ensuring that I'm, I'm putting the right items within my point of use application. That my inventory, I don't have a large amount of, of the same type of product within inventory that I'm cannibalizing one or the other in order for perspective. We need to make sure that your payments, what I'm paying for products, matches what you're going back against the purchase order. And all of that is feeding usage information for me to take a look at. Everything supports one another 
and the content is the key. The structured enhanced information gives you the ability to take a look at that information potentially a little bit differently. So when you look at that information, it really gives you my personal belief, and this is McKesson's belief and what we talk about with our customers. Well, there is not a technology problem in healthcare today. There is a content problem in healthcare today. And we need to enable content to the, to the consumer who is using that particular product. Look at straight business out there. What have they done with their content? They've made it, the context of that content is in the eye of the beholder. We need to start taking a look at some of that same thing. What we think is, is truly, if people are presented with the appropriate information, they will make the right decision. We all know what's happening with healthcare reform across North America and what costs have to be taken out. All of our clinicians know this information as well, and if given the right information, the right choice will be made. We need it to make it easy to find the right item based off of what they're looking for. We need to make our searches what they're used to at home. We need to return the results in priority order, just like an internet search would. So if somebody says that I need a, a size six and a half surgical glove, the appropriate item is returned up top. So they know the right item to order in that particular scenario. The system needs to be able to compare products for a variety of different reasons. We need to utilize those product attributes and support both value analysis and product standardization and really get that item identification, the, the identification at the item level, what that particular item does. It's the only way that we're going to drive specific decisions. We also need to be able to control that. So when someone does make a decision, how do we return context back to that end user that says, hey, you've ordered X, the right decision should be Y based off of our organization's formulary, based off of our contracts, our inventory, and our preferences. And that information needs to be dynamic and really guiding end users at the procurement level to ensure we're getting full compliance to our organizations. We go back to some of those, those, those statistics that we looked at up front. If I've got 100,000 items in my item master, or I'm buying 100,000 items a month, and let's say at the low end, 30% of my items are happening outside of my item master. That's 30,000 lines that I have to look at every month and manually make sure that I'm getting compliance against. We, in the 25 years I've been doing healthcare supply chain, the one thing that's remained content, constant is I've never seen an overstaffed supply chain office. Everybody's being asked to do more with less. We cannot continue to make that the gatekeeper. We need to make the system smarter so the gate happens up front. And if somebody does make a decision, guide the end user. Say, hey, you ordered X. We prov our, our preferred item in that particular scenario is Y. And what's the cost savings that can happen with that? Pre-approve the ones. Why would, if, if someone's making the right decision, why does supply chain need to review that? Why wouldn't those just go straight on? And now all I'm dealing with is the exceptions with all the information like you're seeing on the screen. All of this data needs to happen, and this is the benefit of structured content. So in summary, if we start taking a look at it, we need to start taking a look at how we can change the way we look at content and really make that content-centric process a full 360 across the board. Provide multi-source data normalization. Really start taking a look at multiple sources of data. Even in most provider organizations, I'm getting data out of multiple systems today. How do we do that? How do we resolve the disparity between these particular items from between the systems? How can we identify functionally equivalency by user, by need, by organization? And continuously mine that information for cost savings so that everything is driving and automatically adjusting to provide that predictive guidance so that we ensure compliance to the standardization and the agreements that we put out there. We need to make sure that all of these systems work in concert so that we can get to the levels that we need to in order to make sure that we're, we're, we're getting the savings that, quite frankly, most boards are asking to come out of supply chain. Um, I haven't talked to a healthcare organization in the last two years that hasn't had a double-digit 
percentage expense reduction that is being looked at across the board and a significant um, expense reduction being looked at out of supply chain. In addition, it's not like these supply chains haven't been doing anything and that the low-hanging fruit already hasn't been taken. How do we continue to get blood out of that stone? We need to get to a, a more detailed, granular level to get to that level of information. So I'd like to thank you guys very much for your time today. I definitely wanted to leave some time at the end to ensure we had time if any questions came out. Um, I'd like to, again, thank everybody for your time. If you've got questions, uh, please submit those to Dennis so that he can read them off, or if you think of them later, my contact information is here on the screen. So Dennis, do we have any questions? Scott, thank you. This is Dennis. Yes, we do have some questions. There's a lot of information there, and I want to thank you uh, for us. Let me uh, clarify. I got a couple of questions that were submitted regarding the slides. We will distribute these slides after uh, uh, to all the attendees uh, that have logged in today. So uh, be assured you'll see a, a file this afternoon emailed to you. Scott, the first question that came in <clears throat> came in very early. It asked, what is the connection between big data and artificial intelligence? I know we hear the term big data a lot, and you're talking about artificial intelligence. What's the connection? Or are they the same thing? I don't know. Um, I, I think they're related, but they're not the same thing. Big data normally looks at just large data sets of information. Where artificial intelligence and some of the techniques that we kind of walked through today help in big data is whenever you have big data, you need to have some level of consistency amongst the various data sources. So big data without the ability to make sure that it's standardized or readable or or dis have the ability to disseminate that information, big data just becomes what it is, a large set of information that you can't get anything out of. What AI does, and with, the, with some of the, the techniques that we've seen in, in both our industry as well as others, it really gives you the ability to make sense of that big data when you're looking at it from a gross perspective to get to the granularity that you want. Mm -hmm. Great. I know you talked uh, you know, a lot about data normalization and source of truth and so forth and so on. Uh, we had another question that came in uh, that asked, you know, where do the GS1 standards in the industry's adoption of GS1 standards fit into the world of artificial intelligence? Is that something you could speak to, Scott? Absolutely. I, I think the GS1 standards are going to be are great and are going to continue to be great. What we are looking at in the GS1 standards is really, in many cases, just another attribute that can be associated to data. Um, so I, I'll, I'll bring up GTIN because it's one that's, that's on top of mind of a lot of organizations. GTIN is going to be great for product identification and for electronic commerce. It's really going to enable us to ensure that we are speaking the same language across all of our disparate systems. And while that does provide the ability to look at what that item is at the unit of measure level, it's really just an individual product identifier for that particular item. So we really need to use that information as another attribute or as another data point of the information that we're looking at in whole. GTIN is just going to be another tool that's going to help us continue to standardize our products. OK. Now, Scott, this question came in. I think it's uh, toward, towards the end there when you mentioned about uh, using multiple sources to contribute to your data. A uh, question came in that said, won't the GUDID become a single source of truth for all stakeholders? I think, Scott, if I understand it right, the GUDID is the Global Universal Device Identification Database? Yep. Uh, the, the issue that we've seen in the standards so far, and, and again, th these are all um, dynamic, uh, I think UDID is going to be great for identifying individual products. The issue right now that I see that happening down the road is the UDID is not product specific. It's individual item specific. So in other words, I can have 10 pacemakers on the shelf. Every single one of them will have a separate UDID um, because it's going to include individual information about that item. Components of them should be 
equal, so I should be able to parse it out to identify that particular product. But it is still more of a, um, an identifier to ensure from a clinical perspective that we're tracking that individual device, not necessarily that particular family of information. Okay. Great. Scott, this question came in about predictive analytics. Uh, couldn't predictive analytics also be applied to demand planning and inventory management? Absolutely. Um, these same sets of, of, of techniques I definitely need to be taking a look at it from a demand planning perspective um, as well as for inventory. And what we, we talked about in the, in the presentation was really taking a look at it from a current threat identifier back to inventory to ensure that if someone's bringing a product into inventory, that that's not going to cannibalize something that I already have there. And the system gives you the ability to do that. The same techniques can be taken a look at if we're getting feeds from clinical systems and others to, to predict what is the demand based off the clinical case and others based off of historical usage. All of this information can be used, and it's just another way to use that same um, structured information. Again, the key is we need to have a consistent structure of our data before we start taking a look at some of these other ways of doing business. The same thing can be said of connecting cost to outcomes. If I'm not consistent in the way that I'm looking at a specific type of product, trying to tie product as, as a component of cost from a, a universal analytical perspective to procedure becomes difficult because I might not necessarily have the same data points to say that this is a one-to-one -one comparison and people can, can question the data. So yeah, absolutely, I think it's definitely um, uh, a, another point that needs to be looked at from a, from a demand planning and a, and a forecasting perspective. Great. Here's a question that comes in. It says, sorry if I missed this, but how is the data attributed? Is this automated using artificial intelligence on the description, or is there also manual effort involved? I think it's always going to be a combination of the both. Um, and which the benefit of artificial intelligence is a couple things. One is it makes the normalization of item data very easy, quick, and consistent. It also does give you the ability to break down the descriptive data that you're getting from the manufacturer down into its component attributes. Um, one of the things that um, artificial intelligence also gives you the capability to do is, is identify a confidence factor. So when I'm looking at data and I'm looking at item data and, and specifically attributes, am I confident in the information that I'm looking at? If I've set my confidence um, level and I'm, I'm highly confident in the data that, 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 that there, artificial intelligence enables you to say, okay, I'm confident in this item, pass that through my engine and, and it doesn't require manual intervention to take a look at. If I'm not confident in that information, it gives you the ability to highlight that information, get it to a clinical data analyst to take a look at, identify it, and bring that data back through. So rather than looking at everything manually, you're only looking at those things that, are, that you don't have the confidence level in. Typically, you're looking at most items probably between, I think our, our last figures of, of looking at some of this information is about 87 to 91% of the data has to prove utilizing the artificial intelligence capabilities. and the, the confidence factors that can be put in. So, so dramatically increases um, the amount of throughput and dramatically decreases the amount of manual effort needed in those, those efforts. Okay. Scott, I think we have time for one more question. I just got this one. It, it's read, has the category management approach impacted the industry's master data management efforts? I'm not sure I 100% understand that question, but I'll take a stab at it. Mm. Um, I think the issue that we've had with product categories in the past is we have kept them fairly high level. Even UNSPSC has gone into a little bit better detail than what our historical product categories were able to do in some aspects, um, but it still didn't necessarily take us down to the functional comparison level. Um, that's why we've started taking a look at deeper um, functional-based uh, abilities to compare products. And that definitely is going to affect um, the master data going forward. Um, so absolutely I would say that that's the case, but um, 
hopefully I answered that in the in the context of the way it was asked. Sure. Well, Scott, that was it. That was the last question. And on behalf of SMI, I want to thank you. And on behalf of all the over 50 registered sites and could be hundreds of people that are attending this webinar right now, I want to thank you as well. Let me remind everyone on the line that you'll receive the slides a little bit later today, as well as via email you'll receive a uh, follow-up survey issued by SMI. I encourage everyone to uh, fill out that survey. It's very, very helpful to us. As, uh, as always, we will be having future SMI to you webinars. And uh, on behalf of all of SMI, Scott, I want to thank you and, uh, and your team for putting this information together and for sharing it with us and for sharing the slides and for answering the questions and, and for making the time today. So with that, Scott, I think we'll adjourn today's session. And, and I want to thank everybody very, very much for attending. Thank you, Dennis, and thank you, everybody, for, that's out there on the webinar as well. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye now.